Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster wall, on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson continues with Daniel chapter 5, verses 13 through 19. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, and I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another, yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor, and because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up, and whomever he wished, he put down. This is the word of the Lord. Cool. Holy Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter. Jesus had sent out 70 of his disciples to minister in the countryside, and in this morning's Gospel, they have returned to give Jesus their report. So then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and invite the children up. Sing unto the whole world hears. Ooh. <laughs> Good morning. If you remember, the last couple weeks we've been studying somebody in the Old Testament. Does anybody remember who we've been studying stories about? Um, Daniel and his friends, right, in Babylon. And we studied about how they wouldn't eat the king's food, right, because the king offered his food to the false gods. And then last week, we saw that three of them got thrown into the fiery furnace, and they weren't injured at all because Jesus appeared and, and protected them. Today's story, there's a new king. He comes, and he's having a big banquet, like a 
huge banquet hall, hundreds and hundreds of all the richest and most important people in the kingdom of Babylon. So they're drinking and partying. In the middle of their drinking, the king says, let's go get those cups that we stole from Jerusalem and drink our wine out of those cups. They stole them out of the church in Jerusalem. Well, do you think God was happy with that? No, he was very upset. So the story tells us right away a big hand appeared, just a hand, nothing else. And it started writing on the wall. And it wrote a message. Nobody knew what the message meant. So they went and called Daniel. And God gave Daniel the meaning of the message. And the meaning of the message was that the king was a sinner and that he was mocking God. And so he said, God's going to take your kingdom away from you. And that very night, God took his kingdom away. Another king from Persia came and, and, and came and conquered the city that very night. It's a, it's a, um, it's a great warning to us that God is holy and we need to respect the things of God, right? And he's holy and especially not make fun of God. That's what they were doing, right? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you love me. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. All right. I got the same thing, so everybody just take one. Congregation can rise. We're going to join together in the creed. Go ahead. You don't want one? There you go. All right. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, a Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You should have received a uh, handout this morning. <clears throat> On the back page is the the last portion of Daniel 5, which kind of completes the story that uh, Janelle was reading. So we'll finish that. It's Daniel 5, 22 to 31. Daniel, of course, is speaking to the king. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. This is what the words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple and a gold chain was placed around his neck. And he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, <coughs> Daniel is, um, 
is an important book in the Bible for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is it's a great testimony to the reliability of Scripture. Because all of these kings that Daniel interacts with, the uh, comment at the end that the Medes and Darius conquered the Babylonians, all of these things have been verified through all manner of secular histories and archaeological finds. And so, uh, all of the history in the book of Daniel gives evidence to us of the truthfulness of Scripture. We know that King Nebuchadnezzar did conquer Israel and ruled Babylon. We know that Belshazzar, his son, ruled after him. We know that Cyrus the, the, of the Persians um, uh, conquered Babylon. Today's account from the Bible is where we get the English saying, the handwriting on the wall. In English, it's come to mean something inevitable, something that cannot be changed. Like when when you work at a large corporation and all of a sudden everybody's getting laid off and someone might say, I'm going to get let go, I can see the handwriting on the wall. The real story, the real implications of the handwriting on the wall, of course, are much deeper than that. Years ago, Rabbi Kushner made religious publishing history with his bestseller, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Some said that Rabbi Kushner avoided or sidestepped the equally difficult question, and that is, why do good things happen to bad people? Let's be honest, one of the reasons that the kids and all of us love these stories from Daniel is everyone seems to get what they deserve. That's what we like to see in our movies, right? And in our storybooks, the good guys win and the bad guys get what's coming to them. That's a rare occurrence in life. But it seems to happen constantly in Daniel. In life, Real creeps and villains are rarely, visibly, swiftly punished. Creeps get elected to public office, become presidents of large corporations. They become rich dictators of countries like Iran and North Korea. Creeps become multi-million dollar boxers or singers or athletes or pastors of large congregations. The History Channel ran a series on lawyers called Mouthpieces for the Mob. It was incredible about how these lawyers just sold their souls for the money, and even more incredible was how often they were able to get these slimeball clients off scot-free when it was obvious to everyone that they were guilty. Somebody say, O.J. But in Daniel, creeps get cut up into pieces or burned to a crisp, that's Daniel 3. They get turned into a human dog, that's Daniel 4. They get slain by the sword, that's Daniel 5. They get eaten by lions, that's Daniel 6. And we just love these stories where the bad guys very quickly get what they deserve because we long for a world of justice. But swift, complete justice is so rare in our world. But in Daniel, we see the sleazy kings and the corrupt wise men, and they strut across the stage of life. But then zap, at the end of every chapter, God's great justice comes down. And we know life doesn't work that way. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, justice, perfect justice. In our sense of, of righteousness, we would like to see justice perfect in this world. But it is the very nature of our sin, that justice is so often unrighteous around us, against peoples, individuals. 
Lord, make us people, as you said in the book of Micah, make us people who love justice and who are filled with mercy. Amen. So again, we see the bad guys getting what they deserve, and one of the bad guys in today's story is King Belshazzar. So Belshazzar throws a great party, and he invites thousands of his cronies and friends. And we're told that while drinking wine, Belshazzar gets a wild and crazy idea. Take notice, all you Lutheran drinkers. (laughs) Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar says, bring me the vessels we stole from the temple in Jerusalem. Let's drink from those golden cups so we can mock these stupid Jews and their impotent God. So they bring the golden goblets and they fill them with more wine. And as they drank, they toasted their gods made of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood. And just as Belshazzar finishes singing, I prose it, I prose it, hegemically kike to his gods, immediately, you don't have to wait very long in Daniel, immediately this great detached grisly hand appears and begins the, the silent writing on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. And the king's mocking face changes to fear. His flushed red cheeks are drained pale. And in the sudden silence of that banquet hall, all the guests can hear the royal knees knocking. So the king calls his wise men and advisors. And if you've been with us the first couple weeks in Daniel, you know by now that these guys are not worth whatever the king's paying them. And so it's no surprise that they can't figure a thing out about the handwriting on the wall. So Daniel is summoned. Not knowing what to expect, this lone Jewish exile enters this grand hall to stand before the most powerful king in the entire world and all the pantheon of Babylon's rich and the famous. And one grisly hand hovering gruesomely near the palace wall. And so the king says, <clears throat> excuse me, Daniel, I've heard about you. Interpret the handwriting on the wall, and I'll give you a great new wardrobe, treasures of jewelry, and a great new job, the third highest job in the land. And Daniel, standing before all this crowd, says, O oh, King Belshazzar, you can take your job and... And before Daniel interprets... The words, he goes into this unbelievable tirade against the king. Remember, this is a banquet hall filled with the king's soldiers and supporters. And Daniel says, O king, God gave this kingdom to your father, Nebuchadnezzar, and God gave your father a long leash to do as he pleased, but then your father got too big for the royal britches. And so God brought him low and reduced him to eating grass like a cow. And then your father, the king, humbled himself before God. But you, O Belshazzar, you learn nothing from what happened to your father. Isn't that always the way with our kids? All right. And you, Belshazzar, have exalted yourself to mock the Lord of heaven and to lift up these gods that can't even see or hear or understand. And you have not honored the God who holds your life in His hand. Are there people around us today who do not honor the God who gave them life? Are there people today who mock the very God who holds their life in His hands? And so Daniel interprets the words, many, many, tekel, parson, which roughly translated means, O king, your time is up. It's judgment day for you and your arrogant cronies. God has weighed you in His scales and found you to be a lightweight. And now your kingdom will be given to the Persians. And of course, verse 30 tells us that very night Belshazzar was killed and Darius and the Persians took over the kingdom. In Daniel, you don't have to wait very long for evil to get its due or to see good rewarded. The problem is this, because things don't often work so neatly or so swiftly in our world, we can begin to doubt the idea of ultimate justice for every man and woman. 
we can begin to wonder if there really is retribution against all those who are doing evil and reward for those who are doing good. Because we don't see it happen very often. And so Rabbi Kushner's answer is, no, it doesn't work that way. He says, sometimes good people get bad stuff, sometimes bad people get good stuff, and it's all just a matter of chance or luck or fate, and you just have to kind of roll with the punches of life. Life is like a big roulette wheel, and sometimes you get your good numbers, and sometimes you hit your bad ones. But this story in Daniel and the Bible reminds us that there is an ultimate justice, that God is not mocked and that man reaps what he sows. <clears throat> and while we may get a little pleasure from watching Belshazzar tremble at the handwriting on the wall, the Bible makes it very clear that there is a handwriting from God that condemns you and condemns me as well. That when God weighs our lives in the scales of His holiness and justice, we too are lightweights. One of the passages in your handout from Samuel says that our deeds in life are weighed by God. And it's not just any old God that is doing the weighing, but God in His sinless Holy perfection is the standard that you and I are weighed against. Jesus said to us, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So on one side of the scale is the holiness and the perfection of God. On the other side of the scale is you and your life. That great grisly hand could appear over my casket or your casket, and write the words, many, many, tekel parson. God has numbered your days. You have been weighed by His scales, and you have been found wanting. You see, the terrible part of justice, of people getting what they really deserve from God, is when we get what we deserve. When the handwriting is judging you, and your life. <clears throat> in theory, perfect, perfect justice sounds like a good thing until God is the judge and we are the accused. So, what's the solution to the handwriting on the wall that's against us? Take out your handout. I want to show one passage. We're going to all look at it together. It's the one that's circled. It's letter H. Once you get there, we'll read through this together. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, canceled the handwriting against us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. When you trust in Jesus, there is another hand that comes to write on the wall. It's a nail-scarred hand holding a bloody rag. And with that bloody rag, he erases the handwriting against us. And then he takes that beautiful, bloody, nail-scarred hand up into heaven and writes your name and my name in the heavenly book of life. All praise, all glory, all honor goes to Jesus for His grace and what He did for us. For we are lost sinners, desperately in need of forgiveness, and that's why God sent Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, God, that the handwriting on the wall against each of us has been taken away by Jesus when He was nailed to the cross. We sure love to see evil get what they deserve, Lord, but we pray you do not give us what we deserve, that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you forgive us all of our sins. May we rejoice always, always, 
in the precious hands of Jesus who holds us today and who will lift us to glory someday in the future. We pray these things in His precious and glorious name. Amen. Thank you. At this time, we will collect our offerings and gifts unto the Lord. Uh, Please also remember to sign your attendance pads if you would. Um, Note any changes to any of the information that's on there. Thank you.